so it's just trying to reclaim some memory. My Mac I had about a billion tabs open. Just get these mics on. Apologise for the delay. How is everyone? Still very light out the back, you see. Quite bright today. Um, okay, let me just close this door. Give us a bit of peace. Um, I have my tea. So, who we got online? Uh, yeah, don't be afraid to um, let yourselves be known. Um, again, there's not a great deal of news, but um, let me just see what we have. Oh, I better let everyone know I'm streaming as well. Hold on. Hmm. Okay. Uh, let me have a look for my list of things. Uh, anything FPGA like the PGA Kian's been busy again. I noticed. Um, let me just switch so I can show you the. Um, Okay, that's not working. Let me just switch um, displays to one that is picking it up. Turn the browser on, turn the browser on. There we go. So, yes, uh, FPGA Kian's been doing uh, Bresenham filters. Um, he's using it in graphics because it's quite commonly used in graphics. Um, I tend to use Bresenham. Uh, filters and lines and algorithms um, for the motion control, you know, trapezoidal control and that kind of thing. So he's been a busy, busy boy. He's got so many FPGAs now, I've kind of lost count of how many he's got. But he is very busy. I say he. Uh, I don't know for sure. His preferred pronoun isn't specified on Twitter. Yes, rather busy. As usual. Uh, what else have we got? Enjoy digital. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, there's been a new Litex release. Which is kind of cool. Um, we've now got DDR4 support, or low power DDR4 support. How cool is that? As well as DDR4. Amazing. 
Uh, what else have they got? SD card performance stability fixes. Yeah, imp improved calibration for the DDR stuff as well. Um, they've got VEX RISC SMPS, symmetrical multiprocessing for VEX RISC. Did you know about that? Oh, I don't know if you actually um, hear, uh, Laurie. You're big on the VEX RISC. AES FPU and RVC integration. So I know what AES is. FPU, floating point unit. Uh, AES is encryption. RVC. RVC. Hi, Laurie. What's RVC in VEX RISC? RVC. Oh, RISC vector unit. Vector commands. Is that like uh, SIMD for RISC five? I presume the matrix stuff. Um, new JTAG bone and video core. Hmm. What's video core? Uh, no text. Pull this up. Didn't actually give us a link, strangely. I've been trying to get rid of some tabs. I've got rather too many again. Uh, enjoy digital Litex. I haven't looked at this stuff for a while, actually. Uh, do they talk about latest? Um, it should be a readme, shouldn't it? Change log or some such changes. Here we go. Flipping it. Right, so not much then. Fixes SOC USB ACM. Fix reset clock domain. Fix, 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 fix. Uh, added features. Oh, they've added in the Lattice uh, NX series. That's cool. Support there for <sighs> JSON to DTS. I don't even know what that is. Simplify and improve and allow VEX wrist. Walk 1K support. Quite a bit of bio stuff there. JTAG bone support on Xilinx. <clears throat> Improved JTAG UART support. Um, Vex risk SMP. Add without of order and with wishbone memory capabilities. Um, I text client open FPGA loader. Uh, I text send GTK wire save file generator CPU mock one KX initial SMP support. What's take keep T keep interconnect? Axie, something to do with the Axie bus. I really do need to mount this webcam on something other than um, my monitor. My monitor wobbles because it's attached to an arm which is attached to the desk. So every time you know I bang the desk or move it, put my weight on it, it wobbles, which is annoying. I want to be able to attach it to the shelf above and then it won't wobble. Right, um, where were we? An IRQ support to GPIO-N. Initial low risk IBEX support. TCL script, okay, free write PHYs to reduce resource usage for UART. Ah, oh, dear. 
optional demo for PWM. Saving the MSI are not required. Part of PCI. Oh, I'm squeaking again. Not squeaking now. Mm, export SVD, add constants to SVD export. Cool. BIOS, allow dynamic Ethernet IP address. BIOS, add boot command to boot from the memory. Add simple video out call with terminal. Color bars. Frame buffer plus various PH wires, VGA, DVI, HDMI, etc. No idea what color bards is. It meant to be color bars, maybe. Um, CSI event source process. Why doesn't it support for edge selection? Uh, simplification of the SOC core builder. Uh, add automatic BIOS ROM resize to minimize block RAM usage and improve flexibility. Axi light, block command crossing, ultra scale support. Hmm, it's quite a bit in there. Wouldn't it be great if they could port it to MMIGEN? I bet they love that when we say things like that. Oh, add initial go win G1 N PLL support. Interesting. Wow. Very good. So it's Litex. 2021-04. What else we got on our list? Anything else we need to look at? Uh, more FPGA Kian. More FPGA Kian. Good shot of Black Ice. So it's actually uh, Black Ice MX. Some very good shots of Black Eyes MX. Right, that's it. It's all my news bits. Anyone else got any news they wish to share? I think the RVC is RISC 5 compressed. Oh, what you mean like, are those the equivalent of like thumb instructions that ARM have? Have a quick look. RVC. Oh. Yeah, this five compre compressed instruction set. So I was going to draft proposal uh, 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 named C, which reduces static and dynamic code size by adding short 16-bit instruction encodings for common integer operations. Yes, yeah, so it's quite similar. Typically, over half of the RISC-V instructions in a program can be replaced by RVC instructions. Yeah, it's exactly that same sort of technique, isn't it? That arm is like. Cool, that's good. That should provide some potential benefits. I don't know how good the compiler support is for it. But once the compiler, oh, damn it. Yeah, but once the compiler support uh, is in there, then um, that could uh, be a nice benefit. Right. So let me just uh, switch back to this. Let's talk about what we're going to do today. Oh, I'm going to need browser support, actually, because what I need 
is uh, let's have a look. Let me give you an update. But before we do that, let me give you a review. So first, uh, I'll give you the less than good news first. In some ways, it's bad news. Well, it's bad news for some things, but in other ways, it's actually quite good. So, um, as you were probably aware, I've been working on Amalgam, but been having issues with sourcing the right bits and bobs. In the current climate, that's proved a bit of a nightmare. I ha have had some breakthroughs. Not all to do with Amalgam, though, unfortunately. I haven't had the breakthroughs I've wanted on Amalgam. So I'm going to put push that to one side slightly for the moment. Uh, and when I go back to it, I may well change it. There may be some more radical changes I can make to um, get it done. And also provide some benefit. But I don't want to cover that today. Um, because I'm still weighing up various different things. Uh, one thing I will say is that um, for the amalgam stuff, the conversation I had with Laurie earlier, and Laurie mentioned it would be nice to have a uh, Mr. FP. Is it what's it called? How do you pronounce it? It's the uh, um, God, what's it called? I forget. Mr. FPGA. It is called Mr. FPGA. Um, one of the things that uh, Laurie was saying earlier was uh, that he periodically considers buying the. Um, <clears throat> The Mr. Board, but um, doesn't have to struggle learning all the new Intel tool sets in order to use those FPGAs. You know, all tier a quarter software is um, probably even less pleasant than Xilinx. Um, but there you go, and it's massive as well. But one of the things that you did mention there, Laurie, was um, uh, the D and Nano Board. That Mr. uses is a quite a lot more capable than the current open source board, partly due to its Linux capable ARM chip on the same fabric as the FPGA. Well, I am hoping to start penetrating that problem somewhat with what I'm doing with the ETP5s and that. And with Amalgam, I may push that even further still. Um, there are some interesting possibilities. Um, but as I say, I shall return to that. So I may be able to do something on that front with the amalgam board. Um, and the reason I can do that is because I've actually changed what I'm prioritizing um, with the um, the other boards that I've been working on. So one of the things I want to come back round to is. Um, we are going to have uh, ESP5 boards and I've pretty much got most of the components I need to do them now but it just won't be amalgam like uh, they will actually be black edge like um, if you remember one of the original ones I basically um, kind of revamped that so there's, there's a few changes compared to certainly what it was before um, but I've pretty much got all the stuff now. Um, I haven't got all the bits because there's a few kind of, um, what do you call it, uh, jelly bean stuff that I should be able to get, he said. <laughs> should be able to get easily. Yes. Um, but actually, yesterday I also managed finally to get my. Um, uh, something that I've been after for a while. I say I, have, I haven't got it. They are ordered. Uh, in fact, let me just check. Oh, no, I'm not going to open my email here. Uh, they were meant to ship today, actually. But uh, they're shipping from the States, so uh, it could be later today. Um, in particular, the USB chips I was after. I've had a real problem with the particular ones that I wanted, getting hold of them. This whole component shortage thing is a 
damn nightmare. But I've, I think I've overcome all the tricky bits now. So um, we will have ECP5 boards soon, but I've got to test them first in this new design. So the uh, boards I'm working on, the ECP5 boards that you'll see first, will be in a um, <clears throat> black edge configuration. So I thought I'd better go back over the black edge stuff because what I've got to do is update the black edge so we can do that today and <clears throat> we can just remind ourselves how how all of that works together um, and I also need to talk about the way that I'm going to do the um, the connectivity as well between the um, a Neumann type parts and the FPGA, in this case the STM 32s and the uh, ECP 5s. So that's quite interesting as well. Had a bit of a breakthrough with that. Um, through the millions of combinations, there was one I missed that's enabled me to do some things that I couldn't do before. Interesting. Anyway. So um, we we'll circle back around and try and cover as much of that as I as I can. I can give you a kind of peek, maybe, uh, of some of these ECP5 stuff, but I really want to concentrate on getting the black edge done and then talk about black stack. And if we've got time, maybe show some uh, what the ECP5 is going to look like in the black edge format, although we might have to wait for the next stream for that. So let's just remind ourselves um, where we were. So um, where we are now, I wonder if I can get this out, I better count. Um, screwdriver. Let's roll parts. So I've got three layers jammed together here so that you can see. Um, that's to do with what I'm going to talk about later. Damn it, I don't think I can. I guess I'm going to unscrew this, I think. Crikey. Right. So if you remember, um, Black Eyes MX consists of a carrier board, which is what the three um, mix mods are and the uh, header at the bottom and then the other thing is this ice core board which is the clever bit it sits on top of the carrier okay just to show you those online so the black ice mx board is that that's the carrier it's very simple and it just um, just accepts the ice core board here, and all it does is it breaks it out to mix mod ports. Um, it also has this com debug port down here at the bottom as well. Very simple, but it's mainly passive. There are no active components on it. And here you can see with the ice core sitting on top, and then you can see all the things plugging in here. Um, and the key bit that does the magic in this case is the ice core. So this is just the clever bit that goes on top. You can see the sockets here. Now these sockets and this pinout is called it, it is a standard that I published called or that MyStorm published called Black Edge. Okay, that's originally originally Black Edge was going to be a product. Um, but we decided to call the interconnect black edge. 
um, after the product. But we may be coming back round to that maybe, but forget it for a moment. So what this would enable us to do is, you know, use different carriers if we wanted to, or use different system on a modules conforming to black edge. Okay. So in order to do that, what we have to do is we have to use the black edge. So I've got the repo for this. So one of the things I'm going to need to do in this stream is change this and update this because I'm going to make a few changes that will be backwards compatible with black ice MX, but allow us to maximize what we can get uh, from the new ECP5 books. Okay. So I'm going to do some work on that. So if we look here, what Black Ice, uh, sorry, what Black Edge has as an interconnect is 48 digital IOs on the left hand uh, side of this diagram, plus ground and plus 3, three volt free. And then on the right hand side, we have some control signals that are handy. We have some SPI signals, a UART. We have uh, I squared C. And we have, um, in this case, these pins are unused on black ice. We have TMS, TDO, TDI, TCK, because I thought I'd need them, but we didn't need them. Um, we have a 5 volt, which is really the USB through a diode. We also have a bunch of analog signals. Um, this counts from 0 to 15, i.e. there's potentially 16 analog signals. Okay. Uh, but we only ever use 15 of them on MX. Uh, sorry, on I-score. Meaning we can only use 15 of them on, uh, on the MX board. And then we've got some reserve pins, which aren't used. And then we have P48 continuing on from what's on the left up to P55. Okay. So uh, one of the things that will change is uh, the AN15, i.e. the 16th analog pin, will no longer be an analog pin. I'm going to add that um, along with the re eight reserve pins. And these are going to be nine new uh, low low power FPGA I/O pins that operate at 1.8 volts. Okay, low power ones. And then the TMS, TDO, TDI, TCK, because we haven't used them, those will also be replaced by um, low power signals as well from the FPGA. So there will be one less analog connection, which isn't a problem because we never used it in the first place. And there will be uh, eight plus one plus four, uh, 13. Unlucky for some, oh dear. Sound like a bingo announcer. 13 new FPGA, uh, well, there's probably 12 new FPGA IOs low powered 1.8 volts and then one of them may actually be 3 volts but I'll come back to that or it might not be a sorry it might not be an FPGA pin so um, the other pins will stay pretty much as they are um, although I'm toying with making EN an interrupt pin but I haven't decided on that yet so I probably want to update that. Um, so with the ECP5 versions, we will be fully using every single uh, connection on the um, on the on the Black Edge standard. In fact, there's one, one other pin here which isn't used, and I may use that for the interrupt, possibly. 
Um, so I need to update that. And so this picture only shows the through hole version, not the SMD versions. So there's a few things we might want to update on here. Yeah. So we need to do some work on that. Um, hold on, Lloyd's got a question. What can the low power pins be used for? Well, strange you should ask that. There's a very specific reason for using these. Remember I said I got those USB connectors at last. Um, that's a 1.8 volt device. Um, and to drive those, I need um, eight data pins, one clock. So I use all the reserve signals in AM15 for that. Then I will need the STPDIR reset and there's a fourth one and I've forgotten what it is clock no done that but they're all low power pins uh, that works at 1.8 volt and that's for driving high speed USB so that enables me to have an option on the um, let me switch briefly to the CAD and I can show you black stack we'll come back to black edge in a minute because we've got to do the work on that let me show you black stack um, where it gone? Schematic. Um, isn't necessarily very neat at this point. Well, a schematic isn't. Piece of piece of So let me reveal black stack. So, <clears throat> black stack um, I'm working on at the moment, and I want to do some of the routing on that today, if possible. I want to get these made. So, black stack is basically a carrier that can accept up to six tiles like micro tiles, remember we spoke about those last week for so things like motor control, LCD displays, whatever. Yeah. Um, so there's four on the bottom, and then there's two extra on the top, giving a six. The black edge connector here allows a black edge compatible core board to be plugged in. And then this little board, expansion board here, connects to those low, low power signals. And a few more. It connects to things like the SPY as well and um, UART. And a few 3 volt free signals from the um, FPGA. And one of the things I am. I mean, we could do several boards, but there's one keyboard I want to be in a keyboard. There is one key add on here that I think will be great, which is what I've been waiting for, which is a, the USB 2.0 high speed add on. So that will fit here, and that basically adds a uh, 480 megabit per second USB high speed to the um, FPGA okay um, and the reason I want to do that is because 
it'd be really it's be really great to have a nice high speed mechanism in and out of the FPGA um, and USB is probably the best way of doing this the only other possibility would be to do a gigabit Ethernet but that's much more difficult to do um, with the work that's been done by Great Scott Gadgets and um, Kate you know on Luna um, I think I've shown Luna before I better just re-show you again so that you know what I'm talking about here Bear with me. let me turn the browser back on briefly Not everyone will have seen this. Um, this isn't available yet. They're um, still um, in the process of um, pre-launch. But basically, Luna is a USB analyzer uh, that will analyze USB 2, so full speed and high speed. It's very, very cool. Um, and it uses a lattice, ECP5. 12F. Oh, I put too much sugar in my tea today. Um, and you can see here the uh, the arrangement. You've got a USB coming in here and then a USB going out, or you've got a USB A going out. So C in, C out, or A. And um, this can intercept that traffic. I think it uses um, U10. UTMI, not sure, and then you've got a third um, USB here which sends information, the analysis stuff, upstream to your um, um, PC or laptop, and that uses UM, not UM, UMTI, which is what I will be using on the um, USB add on board. Blackstack. Um, the current implementation, they have a serial and I think an analyzer USB. But I envisage there'll be all sorts of different things. Once once this baby launches, lots of people are going to be doing FPGA stuff on each B5. So, you know, this area, I mean, it. The stuff's already there that we need, but there's going to be a whole bunch more, which is going to be interesting. So, yeah, sorry. Slightly carried away with that. So that's another really good reason to have the um, USB as an option. Now, I'm doing it as an option primarily because not everybody wants it. Um, and even though I've, I've gone the low power route with the USB using the 1.8 volts and the CP version of the USB, which is what I had trouble getting, um, it does still take quite a bit of power. As you imagine, all those IOs operating at, you know, 60 megahertz, etc., over a parallel bus effectively. So not everyone's going to want that. You know, and, and if you're using it in a situation where you're not moving lots of data up and down to, say, a PC, it's not going to give you any benefit, but it will add to cost. So having it as an option gives me the, you know, best of both worlds, to use that wonderful Miley Cyrus phrase uh, that my daughters used to constantly sing to me. Um, so that's really um, why I thought it was important to get that sorted. And it came through. So I've been able to accelerate Blackstack, which was my ideal way of doing the um, uh, the next stage. Now the other good thing about that is you can use Blackstack with um, Ice Core as well. But what you can't do is do the low power, low voltage USB stuff, I'm afraid. However, you can use that expansion area on the side let me show you it again just to remind you this one here you can use that for adding things like an lcd display and stuff potentially or 
um, other communication things. So one of the other things I'm considering putting with the USB is a Bluetooth option. I think for the iScore I might do it slightly differently. I might put on that combination of Wi-Fi, possibly a Wi-Fi chip, something like uh, the ESP32. Um, S2 and a um, what was it that you wanted Laurie you wanted a um, SPI and I squared C LCD interface so I could kind of combine those two and have a small board that goes on here that leaves all of the tiles free for the other stuff. I really see this as a kind of communication board stroke visual my display driver. So you will be able to use this. Um, hold on. You will be able to use this as uh, with sorry, you'll be able to use this for iStorm. So this is the connector area here I was talking about. The little communication add-on, which could be USB or combination of USB and wireless, uh, Bluetooth or uh, LCD and ESP32. Uh, not only that, uh, I want to get these done quite quickly, which is why I want to work on this this evening, because I want to get these ordered get some tiles made up and we can start testing them uh, with the ice core so we've got everything we need to drive the tiles from the ice core so we can start doing that testing and thing, stuff which will be useful um, also it gives everyone that's you know uh, invested into um, black ice MX it gives them another carrier if they're interested and access to tiles as well which I think will be nice. <laughs> I'm not going to make any more ice cores, Laurie. Is the answer. So I can't fix that. So, um, you'll be able to use this for ice core. But, I mean, we could, for instance, put HDMI. Could we put HDMI on that board? Hmm, I'll have to have a think about that, Laurie. I'm thinking about the uh, the um, this board here. Could we put HDMI on it? I don't think. I mean, we can. I'm just not sure how good the signal signal integrity would be. Let me have a think about that. Let me have a think. Um, yeah. Okay. So what do you think, Nori? The black, the black stack. I know it's. It, we're kind of in mixing up a couple of ideas. Because the original ECB5 board looked a bit similar to this. But I think it's a good compromise. And we can deliver all the things. Oh, yes. 
let's quickly right let me see if I can open this without incriminating myself with ongoing work it's in a bit of a mess You just um, you can see the woods for the trees otherwise. Ignore the stuff over here on the right hand side. Okay, ignore the naming. I'm, I'm still not sure what to call this. Black Edge is a possibility with a number um, because there will be a different version. Let me see if I can just get this such that you can't see all that because it's distracting Bring that away this shrapnel is all, all going to disappear Now we can look at this properly. Right, so if we just focus on this for a second, let me just show you around. I mean, I am still juggling it around. Uh, it's obviously not laid out, you know, it's not as mature as uh, Amalgam in that. But I, I can solve it because I've solved most of these routing issues already on Amalgam. Um, oh, one other thing, let me just change that. Let me just show you around the board. There's another bit that we don't need on there anymore. This is a rough uh, this is to be tweaked. Right, so let me just show you around what we have here. Okay. Um, obviously because it's black edge compatible. Ooh. Um, before I move on, notice that there's an SD card underneath here, yeah, which is very similar to um, the uh, current uh, ice core. And then just let me get rid of this layer because it just makes it confusing. You can look properly. There we go. So we've got the um, 48 IOs on the bottom, black edge IOs. Then we've got the ECB5 in the middle. We've got the uh, DDR2 memory. So the ECB5 will, will do a 12F version with a 128 megabit DDR2 uh, RAM. And then we'll also do a 45F with a 512. Sorry, we're going to do a 12F with a 256 megabit EDR2, which is what 16 bit by that's 32 megabytes, right? And then the 45F will come with a 512 megabit, which is a 64 uh, megabytes of DDR2 RAM. Okay. And this is 16 bit wide, by the way. Um, here we have a, you know, a camera connector, a PC camera connector, and that will accept a standard like um, a Raspberry Pi camera. And again, this is low voltage as well, just like the Raspberry Pi camera. Um, And that goes straight into the FPGA. We have a flash size to be determined, probably a smaller one for the 12F and a larger one for the 45F. And I'm not sure, so I think it's going to be a 32 megabit for the 12F. I can't remember what size for the 45F. Come back to that. Um, now he's saying, why have you gone for DDR2 rather than DDR3? 
uh, cost basically and you just can't get the blooming DDR3s um, you can but they're very very expensive at the moment I mean you can get the big wacky great big TSOP ones but you just, you just can't fit them on the board and even those are expensive right now they're a nightmare um, we've got a 25 megahertz crystal for the STM32 and I'll, I'll talk about that in a sec we also have the real-time crystal 32 kilohertz one we've got several power supplies on this board so we're dealing with um, 3 volt 3, 2 volt 5, 1 volt 8 and 1 volt 2 I think it is for the VCC um, which complicates things slightly but got it covered potentially a couple of buttons I'll come back to those in a minute which are connected to the um, might be three buttons like ice core so two connected to the FPGA and one connected to the DFU boot um, I know I'm only showing two on here which reminds me I need to <clears throat> huh. do we need to add that one in okay um, those aren't quite laid out right but it'll probably be similar you know to ice core um, the microcontroller so with, with the the lower cost well, call this the black edge model a the lower cost one um, will have an 12F obviously and 256 megabit DDR2 RAM. The STM32 will be an F7. Okay, so quite powerful. S -s similar power to what you've already got on the ice core, but with much better interfacing, which I'm going to cover in a minute. What is the SD card connected to? Uh, currently, I've got that connected to both. So it's SPI, both to the FPGA and the STM32. Sorry. Because I know you love that, right? I know you love it. To have them both on the same. Um, so the F7 is very fast. That runs at 216 megahertz. There's quite a bit of uh, RAM on it as well. I forget how much off the top of my head. The um, I'll come back to the STM32 and talk about how it's going to work from a uh, right. So base, yeah, I'll come back to that in a minute. Let me do the USBs first. So the the USB here is connected to. The, the one nearest the um, corner. <laughs> Which corner? Top right. Oh, it's been a very long day. So we have more tea. This one here is connected to the STM32, and we're doing some cleverness there. So we've got the um, USB serial connected to that uh, we've also got some clever stuff going on with the debug but I'll, I'll cover that another time because that in itself is you know, an entirely um, unique thing that we need to cover at some point so through that basically I will have a, 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 a nice little box with a USB-C cable that plugs into that that enables you to debug it. Okay, I'll come back to that another point. As I say, that's an entirely different story. But just to make debugging, the idea here is to make the debugging easier, because my setup here drives me nuts with all the wires and stuff and the way we have to do it right now. So that just makes it easier. But also built into there are the STM32 comps. 
which are basically just force boot uh, USB interfaces. And we've potentially got two of those there. Uh, this USB here in the center will probably be, I'm deciding it. So we've got two USB C's, okay? One of which will support um, video over USB. I'm not going to use any proprietary terms here. But basically, you know, a low cost cable from Amazon will enable you to plug into a digital monitor that is effectively being driven by the uh, ECP5. And that is a passive cable, by the way, that doesn't, it's not an active cable. Um, and then the other one is also connected to the FPGA, but probably more likely to be used for things like games and stuff like that. And you'll be able to expand the the connection to more than one USB or other device. Again, I can return back to that at some point in the future. I mean, it may be that these two USBs are actually identical and can be interchangeable, but I'm not sure if I can do that yet. It, uh, I'm finalizing the pins on the ECP5, and there is a possibility that those could be the same and interchangeable. Um, and if that was the case, we could even have a weird situation where we could actually drive two displays, but uh, I don't know if there's any point in that, quite frankly. Um, that might be considerably overkill. I mean, we've got quite a bit of memory, so we could do it, but, you know. Um, but anyhow, there's two uh, USB-C connections to the ECP5, both of which will support um, maybe similar or slightly different alternate modes. And I did mention these before. Maybe it was only on the discussion on the forums. I mean, we can dedicate a stream to looking at that sort of thing. Um, at the moment, it's very experimental anyhow. So until I build the first one of these, I don't know how well that's going to work. I'm hoping it will work well. There's no reason why it shouldn't. Let's put it that way. So we've got lots of I/O connectivity uh, through the USB-Cs there as well, and it's, it's, there's more than meets the eye. These aren't just simply USB. The alternate mode usage um, solves some of the issues that I've had in the past for things like debugging, and also solves some of the issues for things like um, doing digital uh, video output, maybe digital video input as well, but I don't know. I don't want to push the boat out at this point um, and make promises until we're, we're closer to being able to actually prove any of those things. Um, and then, most importantly, so the interconnect, so on the low cost board, the low low cost, the lower cost uh, or black edge board, black edge A, as I say, uh, that has a 12F, 256 megabit memory and an F7. So the interconnect between the STM32F7 and the ecp 512 f is an FMC connection. And I've, I've mentioned that before with a album as well. So it's a similar thing going on with a album. So you've effectively got a 24-bit uh, muxed address with 16-bit data on the FMC. So it's like a PS RAM, parallel PS RAM um, use of FMC. Uh, FMC being the memory expansion part of the STM32. So you've got a nice high-speed interface. Now on the F7, I think you can run that at clock, H clock speed, which will be 108 megahertz. So you've got 16 bits, 108 megahertz. And because you've got a 24-bit address, I think that gives you full addressing into the DDR2 for that configuration. I'm not going to do the math now. I think I've already tried that before. 
Um, and there's an additional pin, there's an additional select um, when you're using the um, the uh, more powerful version, which I haven't spoken about yet. Uh, the other thing we've got there is SPI, obviously, to the flash, to the SD card, and to the ECB5, so it can be configured. That will run... Oh, I can't remember what the top speed is on the SPI. It's pretty fast. Um, the, the analog, the mixed signal side of it, supports up to 15 mixed signal pins from the STM32 to the top part of that black edge so that's you know identical effectively to what you've already got on the ice core uh, and by mixed signal I means it can be digital as well as analog but obviously those digital pins are lower bandwidth than the FPGA pins because they come from the SDM32 um, what else have we got better remind myself uh, We've got some RGB LEDs as well, and I'm still finalizing finalizing those, how we're going to drive those. Or, or we'll have at least four LEDs. There may be RGB, there may not. Depends how many pins I've got left over. I'm struggling to um, get enough pins now because I've connected so much up. Um, so I've covered that. I've covered the uh, display output. And I've covered the uh, uh, different voltages. Right, okay. Cool. So for the Black Edge A, that's pretty much it. Um, I don't think there's any features I've missed. Obviously, you've got the UART I squared C that go into the STM32 F7. Um, plus a load of chip selects and you also got all your debug SWD debug including the monitor line which is kind of cool um, and there's some spare lines as well in there between the F7 and the FPGA uh, or there's a UART line between the two for example um, it's quite important there's also an interrupt line between the two now for the Black Edge B, if you like, the uh, the kind of more souped up version. Um, we've got a 45F, ECB 45F on board, FPGA wise. We've got double the DDR2 RAM, so we've got uh, 512 megabits, which is 64 megabytes. And in addition to the FMC connection, that we have to the ECP5 on the um, on the on the um, Black Edge B, we use an STM32 H7. Now the H7 is a more powerful STM32 that runs at 400 megahertz, so it's, it's quite a bit faster um, than the um, F7. Not only that, but it's got a lot more RAM. And a bit more um, ROM, uh, and we'll probably have a larger flash as well on it. So it's a very, very nippy 32-bit um, processor with the Arc cache and everything else that comes with that. And it has some great DMA stuff inside. It really can eat its cake and chew gum at the same time. Um, and then the other thing that we've we've got with this, which is interesting. Um, that I wanted to optimize is in addition to the FMC connection or connectivity, the umbilical, if you like, between the uh, STM32 and the ECB5 that gives us a heterogeneous solution. We've also I've also managed through some miracle of combinations to actually do a, a DCM DCMI interface between the two um, which uses an embedded synchro 
So we basically got a ded dedicated video link um, or video, not bus, but video, because it goes one way, it goes from the ECB5 into the STM32. Um, and that is used to move video between the two. And you may be thinking to yourself, well, why on earth would you do that when you've got the FMC? Well, I thought long and hard about this. And although the FMC is very good, um, basically, in that scenario, when you're using the FMC, the STM32 is the master. It has to go and request and access the data which normally means going to registers and or internal memory in the ECP5, like the block RAM, whatever, or via, you know, the internal bus in the ECP5 to the DDR memory. So the latency, the turnaround on that is quite high relatively. Um, by having the 8-bit dedicated to video, the that really provides an endpoint for streaming type configurations. So if you're doing streaming manipulation of video or pipeline video, and Laurie will be familiar with this because he started working on some of this stuff, trying to solve some of these problems himself. So the, um, the USB 5 can be pre-processing video, doing pixels and lines, etc., whatever it wants, and then it can be passing it through using a standard format like a, you know, a 422 or whatever it is, very, very, you know, in real time, back to the STM32, to continue the streaming model. So in the software model, it will look more like a continuous stream. There is no STM32 calling the ECP5 memory registers, setting things up to do a transaction back. It's happening in real time as a stream. So that's what the benefit of that is. And you can be streaming video in that's being processed at the same time as using the FMC bus. So I can be DMAing over both of those things concurrently. And that has a lot of advantages. So for the B model of the Black Edge, it's really much more sophisticated and powerful. Um, and it's much better if you're in a scenario where you need to do video processing or DSP or that kind of stuff uh, and anything where you've got kind of streaming uh, or pipelined uh, data processing going on between the um, FPGA and the uh, von Neumann parts i.e. between the ESP5 in this case and the STM32 in a proper heterogeneous manner okay Laurie saying does it have any camera connectors did I miss that earlier this one here, sorry, that connects to a Raspberry Pi compatible camera, and that's a low power connector as well. So it uses low power, um, same same thing that Raspberry Pi uses, basically. And there's lots of copies of those um, sort of cameras out there. So you can have video coming in here from the camera into the ESP5 being processed, maybe using DDR memory. That could then be buffering out the low power to the low power bus, which could then in turn be sending it to USB3. So you've got live video on USB3 from the host if you've got that plugged in, for the extra board. Um, meanwhile, it could be processing the video and it could be sending that to the STM32, which could be DMAing that. At, the, uh, at an endpoint and stream, and it's got the FMC interface calling into all the logical bits on the tiles, etc. However, you want to use that. Also, using the DDR2 memory if it needs to. Although, you've got to be careful about that if you're using it for video at the same time. So, it's a fairly sophisticated, very, very powerful, in my opinion, um, solution. And, you know, Current consumption wise, it's going to be fairly modest, I think. I mean, it's not going to be a low power device, right? We're using a 400 megahertz STM32 H7, right? It's going to use a bit of power. Um, the ESP5 uses quite a bit of power. 
However, we can take that power down. We can put the STM32 into a kind of very low power mode if we need to. Um, not sure how much of that we can do on the ECB5, but anyhow, there are options available to us. So I think that kind of covers the plan. Um, but let me know what you think, folks. Have I covered all well better? Have I missed anything, Laurie? I'm bound to have missed something. You normally notice. Let me get my refreshments. How are we doing for time? RTC and batteries in the past. Well, we've got um, well, that's the point. Where do I put the V bat? So I think I can put the V bat. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, those can go on the black stack. We'll switch over to that in a sec. Not sure. I mean, I could put it on the back. These boards are quite small, remember. Depends how big we want the battery back up. I was thinking of doing proper battery stuff for the tiles. So, for example, the communications extension board that may have USB on it could actually have power management on it as well, potentially. But, yeah, good point. Let me just add some in before I forget. I should put a note to that effect. Hmm. Added. Good point. Good point. I'll put a note in the schematic to add that in if I can. Um, might be better on the black stack part rather than the black edge part. Rather than on the core board, if you like. Still not completely stuck on names as well, by the way. Um, no, no, no. It's kinda I mean one possibility is to use the um I'm gonna call these the pro range as well, by the way. These new boards. I want to be able to separate them. Uh, oh, good point. Um, let me um, shove these behind as well whilst I know it. Switches are a bit wonky. The buttons. So you get a impression, an impression of roughly where they're going to be. I don't think this positionally, not much is going to change. This. Uh, let me also 
Finish on that set. Oh, that might be on the wrong layer. There we go. There. So yeah, when it, naming wise, I was thinking the range will call, be called the Pro Range for the ECP five. Black Edge is a possible name, you know, with a number after it. Because I'd have to differentiate between um, the 12F F7 version and the 35F slash H7. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, you could have Black Edge H7, Black Edge F7, possibly. Um, or we could use the core terminal. Laurie's saying, are oh, the USB to HDMI? <gasps> he said the word. <laughs> Cables. The same as the MacBook. Yeah, sort of. I'm not sure if it's Thunderbolt 3 or not. But yeah, it's basically the, uh, it's a USB alternate mode. They're kind of passive cables. To connect to a digital display device I think they're the same. Let me just have a look. I did have a look. Oh, I've closed it. Damn it. You know, the um, tabs are like, or well, your browser in some cases is just like your attic. Put loads of stuff up there for ages, and then you get bored and you think, I haven't used that in ages. Then you get rid of it, and the moment you've gotten rid of the tab, what happens? You need it. Okay, so I'm looking at one example here. I think th this is the sort of cable we're talking about. Let me just turn the browser on so that you can see um, something like that. Fairly low cost things. Now, I don't know, are they the same as the Thunderbolt 3 ones? They talk about Thunderbolt 3 compatible. I don't know, I'd never understood the Apple lo um, lingo. Didn't they? Wait a minute, didn't they merge? I can't remember what happened. Didn't they merge like Thunderbolt with the USB standards or something? Normally Apple always have to have their own, don't they? Have to be unique. But yeah, there's, there's bugger all in them. They're, they're, they're passive cables, but there is some stuff in there. There's some um, passives, like some caps. Uh, it may even be like a little um, uh, switch thing in there, but I'm, uh, don't quote me on that. I can't remember exactly. We're not using that part anyhow. We're only using the um, video outputting part effectively. Does that answer your question? Look. 
built in advanced smart chip to ensure safety advanced smart chip you mean it's like a bunch of diodes to protect the voltages <laughs> right oh i've been reading up about usb c power delivery as well which is very cool So, have I covered all the necessary bits? Do, does everyone here understand where we're going with this? Does anyone have any comments they'd like to make? Would anyone like to tell me I'm completely wrong and insane going down this avenue? You've had your chance. That's it. That's all you're going to get. Sip of water, and then I'm going to move on. I mean, Laurie, it may completely fall apart, you know, once we put these on the board and try it. Um, this magic display outputting in alternate mode may not even do what we hope, but I think it will. It's pretty simple what it's doing, frankly. Um, so Laurie's now saying, I'm not sure why you switch from Amalgam Connector. Well, we're still going to do the Amalgam Connector. Rewind. We're still going to do the Amalgam board, which will have a different connector, probably. But I have problems supplying the component for that. See, what I want to be able to do on the Amalgam board is... Either use the ECP5 F or alternatively, which is another possibility, is use one of the Crosslink NX chips. Both of those have much larger internal memory structures. Uh, but if I go to these B585F, I have to go for the 381 pin device. I mean, you can get the smaller ones, but then the circuit, PCB circuit costs go up. Not only that, you don't get the option, if you wanted to, to do the PCIe 2 or Surdays, high speed Surdays ports on them. And I'd like to retain the ability to do that you see so it's not that i'm switching from the amalgam connector because we're still going to do the amalgam it's just that is going to be it is a you know different course to the black edge stuff I mean, Black Edge gets us an awful long way um, at relatively a good value, whereas the Amalgam thing is going to be much more expensive, I'm afraid, because of, you know, the FPGA is much more expensive. I mean, seriously much more expensive. Particularly at the moment. It's kind of crazy. Oh. Yeah, I was going to say, we haven't dropped any frames as far as I'm aware this end. Sorry, so I was just saying that we're still going to do the amalgam. That's not changed. It's, it is delayed, but it's not changed that we're still going to do it uh, in that format, you know, with that type of connector. Um, when you go for that type of connector, what you have is, um, let's say, DCs, 
you know, because something has to go because you've got less pins, right? Unless you go back up to 100 again. You know, because the current amalgam was 80 pins, whereas Black Edge is 100, which enables you to put the extra ADCs in. Um, so, that's one item. The other item is the FPGA, because I want to be able to go to the 85F, so we have to use the larger 381 ball. I've looked at using the smaller devices with a higher pitch to 0.5 pitch, but that puts the PCB costs up considerably. Not only that, you are losing the opportunity to do the four PCIe um, slash PCIe 2 slash Surdies slash the possibility of doing USB 3. And I'd really, 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 really like to do USB 3 if possible. Um, so that would mean either going with the ECP uh, 585 F uh, Surdy's version 381 ball uh, 0.8 mil pitch, which is a bit larger, and we need a bit more room. We're not quite as crushed as we are on Black Eyes, so you know with the Amalgam layout, there is some more room. Um, or the other possibility I was looking at is we could go with a crosslink NX. Um, now, with the crosslink NX, right, on Amalgam, um, we could either go the ECB5 or the crosslink root, crosslink NX root. Now, both of them have much more memory inside, which is better for the video stuff, right? I mean, you've seen this yourself. So if you want to be able to store more, um, both of those devices are better. Um, they have different advantages. The... Uh, if I was going to go for the uh, Crosslink NX, I'd probably go for the 256 ball version. Um, the, adva that, the advantage, well, hmm, yeah, probably 256 ball version that can support. Um, Some fairly fast memory as well, so I could still. Do, I'd probably. I don't know. Maybe just go with DDR3 on that. Don't quote me on it yet. But DDR3 might be useful. But the good thing about if we did go the crosslink NX route over the 85 ECB5 85F, is we'd also get the MIPI support in the FPGA. So what the MIPI support does is. It makes it easier when you're connecting the camera. There's a lot less logic involved. But it's not so much on the camera front that's a benefit. Where it's a benefit is driving the higher res displays, you know, the LCDs. Um, yeah. So that could be a benefit. Um, Cost-wise, they are similar, but you get less lookup tables for your money on the uh, Crosslink NX than you do on the um, ECP5. However, your power profile is much lower. So it depends how important power is to you. It's considerably lower power. It's also got a faster fabric. Um, so what you do with the uh, logic inside is faster. It has a few other benefits, like it has a RISC V compatible ALU section in it. I think DSP-wise, I think they're similar. I can't remember what the difference is off the top of my head, DSP-wise. They're both quite well endowed in that sense. So yeah, either way, the Amalgam is a uh, much more... Um, powerful system that has 
you know, um, unfortunately, much more expensive FPGAs in them. I was also toying with the possibility of um, having an even faster STM32 in there. Like a seriously fast one. Um, but that's a conversation really for another day. So we are still going to do it, is what I'm saying. Um, it's just I'm a bit constrained at the moment with that. So it's going to take longer. I want to get these uh, black edge runs out first. Because I've now got all the important pieces for that. So I can deliver. That's the most important thing. Right now, it's delivering stuff. Because supply chain is seriously messed up. Or more importantly, deliver at a reasonable cost. You, know, you can deliver at any cost, it's not a problem. But people won't pay that kind of money. You have to deliver at a reasonable cost. And I think I'm being able to do that with the um, black edge stuff. And or any other name that we come up with for it. So let's switch back to the black stack. Just to remind you. Did that answer your question, Laurie? Sorry, that was elongated and I probably said it twice. Because of um, we had some issues here in the first one. So back to the stack. The browser. Oh, where's the browser still showing? Ah, oh, I'm not it. <clears throat> OD having network issues, Laurie. I hate it when that happens. There is not much worse in the tech world than having to deal with network issues. Particularly the internet ones, because you can't always do anything about that. Um, so yes, Blackstack. Uh, so let's have a quick look at this here. So just a reminder. So on the bottom, you can't see it here, because these are in the way. If I was to move these, I'll put them back in a sec. Ooh. Not move the wrong one now. Typical. So anyhow, under there, look. <laughs> Again. So yes, I've got four tiles underneath. What's the tile? Oh, I better remind you what a tile is. Some of the other people join us may not have seen it. Oh uh, no, I don't that one. That's still underway, that one. Uh, let's find a more complete, simple one. Oh, oh I'm opening all the wrong ones. Sure, there we go. There's a really simple one that we did. Did we do that last stream? I can't remember that. So that's a very, this is a, an example of a very simple tile. So effectively, black stack will be at a house up to, up to six of these tiles. Uh, which one is that? That's, that's a stepper tile. It's the dual stepper tile, isn't it? Using the trinamic. Uh, yeah, I, we did another one as well, didn't we? That's the trinamic stepper trial. We did the basic one as well. Can you remember? No. I lost it off my most recent list, I think. No, I don't know. Stepper. Stepper trial. Ew. Can't find it. It's 
just go back to that one for a moment. So yeah, they can be as simple as that. Um, so what goes on a tile? Well, these examples I've been looking at here are like motor tile because the tile connectors themselves carry um, higher voltage and current through multiple pins um, in addition to the low voltage signaling etc they can also be isolated if you need and they've got these grounding mechanical mounts as well so they're very solid um, I'm not going to revisit why we went down that direction because we've already covered that in previous um, previous stream episodes but the point is to provide a good mechanically sound uh, expansion system um, for things like automation certainly robotics anything like that as well but also all the standard stuff that you might want to do through expansion so let's just go back now uh, and just to remind you also what's on that connector so we have eight signal pins from the ESP5 going to it. We have an SPI set including the chip select. We have two mixed signal pins which can be analog or digital. Plus we have free volt free and ground um, as well as the high voltage supplies and the extra grounding and shielding. So it's a fairly flexible interface. You can kind of think of it as like a uh, P mod with extra grunt and mechanical soundness. Um, that's not just not flaky, basically. Let me go back. So the idea between behind the stack. is we can have up to six of those. So we can have four of those on the bottom and two on the top here. Then the edge, sorry, the um, edge, the um, black edge or the ice core boards go on here. And then this small expansion board goes on the back for extra communications. A few more questions from Laurie, look. <laughs> Not sure if it's an ISP or Wi Fi or laptop that's going on. What carries a high current from the core board to the carrier? Well, these 50 pin uh, 1.27 pitch connectors, which are nice and low profile, they're that kind of profile. So, this is a free layer stack, which is why I put this together so that you can see what a free layer stack looks like because that's what black stack is going to be like, like a three layer stack although the order will be different from what I'm showing here um, so yeah if you look at let's go back to your access board so on here can you see these blue dotted lines they're carrying the higher current. So the top part of that is de de dedicated to say V plus and the bottom part is dedicated to V minus. Um, and then you've got your other signals in between. Basically. Although they may all be four layer boards. You can do two layer boards. But four layer boards is a bit better. But a nice and chunky uh, you can deliver quite a lot of amps through that. Does that answer your question, Roy? So back in black, ha ha ha, back on the stack. Uh, and just a reminder, so the one on the right hand side here, uh, for ice core we could use that as a as a LCD connector, it's my LCD. I will look at the HDMI possibility as well. Um, although I think we might be pushing it for that. 
there might be a compromise involved if we go down that route. Um, but on the black edge, when you've got a black edge board in there, you've got lots of IOs in here. So you've got 13 low power IOs plus a few extra, uh, plus the SPI and UART. So on this board, you can fit, you know, a USB to high speed interface. Um, which will give you 480 megabits per second up and down, up slash down, which is more than adequate, and you can move video and all kinds of stuff up and down through that, which is cool. You, and you can, as I said before, you could probably use some of the lunar stuff. Um, you could also put a Bluetooth chip on here or a Wi Fi chip, etc. It's another possibility. So you've got some wireless comps. That's what this little niche piece pieces here um, yeah it's as simple as that really at the moment this is just a passive board there is nothing on it but we might want to add things like battery backup so ooh, that reminds me let me just add one of those on whilst I think about it uh, Um, what should we go with? Let's put one of those on for the moment. Just to remind you. But for different applications, you might want different things. So, um, and that will fit nice and snug under the um, black edge or ice core. You could, for example, have power controls on here. So we could add an MPPT um, chip, as well as battery connectors, as in like LiPo connectors. Put some big batteries on, and then the whole thing will just be solar powered. So if you wanted to do it for like kind of robotic purposes or something, it can be completely autonomous in that sense. Well, sort of remembering, yeah, I put the uh, little battery backup on there. Uh, but if the power comes into the core board and that is connected to, wait a minute, but if the power comes into the core board and that is connected to the carrier of the black edge connector, I still don't understand, right. So the high power doesn't go into the core board at all. Anything that goes into the core board is five volts. Although I think you can do 1.5 amps. I mean, we could have it take more if we wanted to, but we probably won't need any more than that. The high voltage stuff is done on the black stack side. It's either done by this small daughter bar on the right here, or um, we can connect it into any of the tiles. Any of those tiles can su supply the uh, higher voltage. Are you with me on that, um, Nori? I might not explain that properly. So the higher voltage, higher higher power uh, is distributed to the tiles and also to this. Um, I need to give this other connector some sort of name. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to use the USB-C. No. Each of the core boards can be powered by the uh, USB-C. And it can pass that voltage down. But this this supply I'm talking about for the tiles is a higher voltage supply. Now, I could, for example, 
make one of the tiles or this kind of connector here I could put USB-C connectors on there and have the power delivered in that way if I so wished um, depending on the wattage requirement well yeah I mean it depends what you're doing Laurie um, Laurie by the way sorry Laurie said but is USB-C high voltage enough well it is for some apps but for a lot of apps it's not for a small robot yeah but normally in, in, in many cases you're talking about you know, if you were doing a robot for example it's going to be battery powered so the way that gets power may be charged over USB-C it may be more than one USB-C connector the maximum that you can push through a USB-C connector is about 100 watts uh, so that's 5 amps 20, 20 volt but even that's pushing it most tend to they don't tend to go above 50 normally but some go to 75 what but you could have multiple C type connectors if you wanted um, I'm also going to have connectors on here the screw connectors maybe I should add those in just for clarity well I'm not going to put them in for the moment but yeah it's easy to add them into the stack board for example so let me just put some uh, on here To remind me, we can use these sort of connectors underneath a tile or above a tile, somewhere in the sandwich, pull in plus and minus. Or you can bring it in through one of the tiles, or you can bring it in through this. It depends on the application, essentially. Um, so you might have a board that's USB C with a small charger. That might be enough to charge the battery up. You know, if you only need like a 5 amp 20 volt supply or something, then USB C will probably do you. Um, because normally you're just using that for charging charging the battery and you may have some lipos on the back you know if it's a, like a robot or something so it's going to need to move around you know when it docks with its charging station or whatever then it's slightly different but um, yeah so that that supply is separate lorry and can be isolated if you want some cases you might want it isolated uh, the way that gets in is normally through um, either this connector or one of the tiles or through these screw connectors. You wouldn't normally provide it through the, um, the core board unless it was a very low amount because the connectivity on black edge doesn't carry that much current down. And currently it's only rated at like five or six volts, you know, not 20 volts. In the situations where you need the higher voltage, you'd have a higher voltage supply, you'd have USB power over USB, maybe multiple USBs, or you'd have a solar panel with an MPPT adapter, or you just have simply batteries that you charge separately or something like that. Or you may have, you know, a live feed of voltage coming from something else that this is attached to, you know, in an automation situation. There are lots of different ways you can skin that, so it depends. Um, it's not really fixed. You can configure it how you want to, is the answer. Does that um, explain it, Laurie? Have, have I done a half decent job or am I just confusing matters? You don't sound convinced. <laughs> How are we doing for time? I don't think we're going to get much routing done. So I'm going to have to um, 
call it an evening in a minute. I did want to get some routing done, but it doesn't matter. I can do that tomorrow. Cool. Any other questions, Laurie? I, I'm not going to do any routing now because we're already at 10 o'clock, so I'm, I'm going to stop in a minute anyhow. Do you think the whole thing makes sense? Am I missing anything? I'll ask again just in case anyone else has got it. Or um, are we okay to go ahead? I mean, have a think about it anyhow. You can always let me know later. The phone's going off now. Hmm. Excuse me for tapping phones and concentrating elsewhere. Right, good. So I should proceed then, Laurie. Hmm? It's got a bit small. And like I say, I've got most of the bits now, apart from a few jelly bean ones that I should. Oh, 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 haven't we heard that before? Be able to get in when I need. Yes, I want one. So do I. God, so do I. Um, so the plan, just to remind you, what I'm going to do, Laurie, is I'm going to get some of the, I'm going to get this laid out ASAP. Um, the black stack board um, and a couple of tiles. And then I'm going to order some so at least we can start playing with the tiles and make sure all of that stuff is hunky dory um, with an ice storm. Yeah. So we can get on with that stuff in the meantime. Yeah. And then when I've got the black edge protos done, then. Don't worry, Laurie, you'll be first on the list, mate. You know you will be. I hope to make up several, assuming I don't completely mess them up. And assuming I don't end up with any parts still missing. I think I'm pretty comfortable now. Pretty confident, man. Confident. I've got the, I've got the difficult bits, right? It's the key thing. So if that's it, I'm going to call it quits now for this evening because I'm pretty tired. It's been very long. Um, let's catch up again on the stream next week. So it's probably going to be Wednesday again next week to do the stream. I will be on Discord. Uh, I will be on the forum. Uh, I need to put something on the forum about this. Maybe. Oh, yeah. Maybe I need to set up a channel on the forum as well. No, sorry, on Discord for Black Edge, possibly. Uh, now that I've got a name, I mean, I, I don't know if it's worth having a separate Black Stack channel at this point. Let's just, what I'll do is I'll set up a, um, uh black edge first i think and then we can cover it all there and if we need to break off uh black stack from that we can But I've just added that into Discord now. If we need to uh, cover any of that stuff. Cool. Right. Okay.
Um, see you all down at the forum or on Discord or next week on the stream. Ciao.